Lockdown football is what they're currently going through in France at the moment. Nothing doing until August. Hi again, Will Downing with you alongside Mark Rodden, Stefan Jorny, Dimitro Juli, and today Matt Spiro, who will be talking us through the renaissance of French football and the current shutdown in the sport in France. A great walk down memory lane for me last night. The video archivist Killian M2 did a video premiere of the 1985 FA Cup final replay between Liverpool and Manchester United. The drawn semi-final is the first live club game I ever remember watching in full. The Mill Cup final, I decided to go out playing halfway through between Norwich and Sunderland. Now, I'm sure I must have watched previous Cup finals, but I just don't remember them. So, gentlemen, what's the first game you remember watching? And I'll start with you this week, Matt. So the first game I remember watching, it, it almost certainly wasn't the first game I watched, but the first game I vividly recall was Watford against Everton, the 1984 FA Cup final. Um, because I grew up in Pinner, which is quite near Watford in northwest London. A lot of my mates were Watford fans. I was a big John Barnes fan. And it, yeah, I just remember it being a really special event and the whole kind of the whole of Watford and the surrounding area was was getting very excited. So I remember that. But I think I started going to watch Arsenal and I saw, like like most Arsenal fans at that time, I think I saw a series of nil-nil draws before I, I actually saw a goal. But I can't remember the first game uh, that I saw at Arsenal. How about you, Mark? I have really good memory of watching Ireland against Romania and the penalty shootout in World Cup 1990, David O'Leary's winner. Um, I was about, what was I, six, going on seven. But the game I really remember is one I listened to because I listened to a lot of Five Live and BBC Radio Scotland and um, parents from Donegal grew up listening to Celtic matches on BBC Radio Scotland. It was... uh, Liam Brady Celtic October 1991 away against uh, Neustadt Zamex in Switzerland and uh, Celtic lost 5-1 with the Egyptian Hossam Hassan getting four goals Brian O'Neill getting the reply for Celtic and I think Celtic won the second leg 1-0 that set me up for uh, a life of uh, crushing ho- disappointment hope and then disappointment in terms of uh, following football teams Stefan my first game I remember was uh, Nantes Saint-Étienne it was one of the big games in the 80s. I think it was 1983. I was very young. I can't remember exactly, like, you know, the, the score. I was with my dad, and uh, it was a great night. Evening game, as usual in France. Well, at the time, anyway, things had changed with TV. In the 80s, Nantes saint Etienne was the biggest rivalry in French football. And if you want me to uh, get another game, the World Cup in uh, 1982, France against uh, Germany. In the semi-finals, I was still a young boy, but uh, I remember vividly uh, the celebration with Alain Giras when he scored that famous goal and Maurice Trezor, who never scored goals, basically, and, and Michel Platini. And uh, yeah, definitely my two first games in football, which I remember to a certain extent. But non saint Etienne, the atmosphere in the stadium was Marcel Sopin. The stadium that doesn't exist anymore. It was, uh, it's used for the academy, but uh, the stand, there's only one stand the other stand has been uh, destroyed and replaced by apartments, which is very strange. But it was a very tiny, uh, a smallest ground, 20,000, and very close to the pitch. And a great atmosphere right beside the La Loire. It's a big river in France. And uh, yeah, it was a great night of football for a young kid. Uh, Dimitri? Well, it's got to be World Cup in 1982. I do know that I watched the very first game in France for England. But of course, the one that made the biggest impression was the Soviet Union v Brazil in the first round because it was a fantastic game. And uh, I have those memories from that particular game. So I, I think I, I probably have to say this one because I only have a big recollection of uh, France v England, but that game with Brazilian team especially, you know, it's just uh, something to remember. And also, Will, you forgot to mention that football is back in Costa Rica. So back over to Paris and Ligue 1 commentator Matt Spiro, host of Le Beaujeu, the official Ligue 1 podcast. New book coming out as well, by the way, Sacre Bleu, from Zidane to Mbappe, a football journey. We'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, the shutdown in France, Matt, how's that being viewed overall? Um, hi, Will. It's been viewed sort of... Yeah, a, a little bit like in other countries, I think, insofar as 
people don't think the instructions have been that clear. The government's coming for a lot of criticism. There have been lies about the fact that nobody needed to wear masks and actually they didn't have masks in France initially and that was why they were saying that. So yeah, there's been the usual sort of um, discussion and, and controversy. It's been stricter actually here, certainly than in the UK where my family are, where you know you can basically go out without being checked all the time because here in france we've had to fill out um, an authorization form every time we want to go out even to walk the dog or to go and buy some bread or something but um yeah look we've got through it in some respects because the lockdown's been eased 10 days ago and um my kids have sort of started going back to school only sort of one or two days a week but uh yeah it's been it's, it's been a very strange period and we also know that the football was stopped very quickly. So we haven't had so much the debate, when is the league going to start again? Because as soon as the Prime Minister said there's going to be no sport until September, the French League had an emergency meeting and they said, well, listen, we're, we're, we're stopping the season now. Uh, we're going to give the title to PSG. We're going to work everything out on a points per game basis. And uh, yeah, two teams have been relegated. There's been a lot of arguing, but there's been no debate about when the league is going to start because it is not going to restart. And was there general unhappiness or acceptance that that was it, the league's called, we're done? I think initially, uh, of course, and it, there was you know, anger, particularly from the two teams that were relegated. Um, but I think initially, generally, people accepted it. And then the longer we've gone on and the more um, people have been hearing about other leagues, and you know, obviously the Bundesliga starting, and uh, we've had different clubs taking legal action a- against the league, and we've had Leon. Um, and their president, Jean-Michel Aulas, who is very outspoken and also very powerful in the French game, taking legal action and um, still sort of campaigning for the league to restart, you know, saying it's not too late, we can change our minds. So I think in more recent days, people have thought, well, hang on, maybe it was a bit hasty. Maybe we should have waited a couple of weeks, looked into all the different possibilities. But yeah, I mean, the main thing, to be honest, Will, in France, I think it's similar in a lot of countries, you know, the, the finances are driving these decisions. Then in France, I've got a new TV deal starting in August with, with Media Pro who've come in and uh, the new French domestic deal is going to be absolutely huge. It's more than a billion euros. First time it's gone that high. And I think the French League decided they needed to be, or they needed just to make sure there was no way Media Pro could back out of this deal. If, you know, if for example, they said, we're going to try and play, finish this season and we might have to push next season back to January, you know, that might be giving them a chance to say, well, hang on, we're not going to give you this money. And then French football would have been, you know, in enormous trouble. It's already in big trouble. But yeah, if, if that TV deal fell through, it would be the end for a lot of clubs, I think. By the way, how much of a surprise was it that Media Pro came in to, to launch a new channel? Because they are known as a global distributor and not, you know, an outlet to watch. Very surprising. Um, it was surprising that the deal was that lucrative, like I said, over, over a billion. I think the last deal was just under 700 million. So it's a massive increase at a time when Ligue 1, you know, I wouldn't say it wouldn't warrant a massive increase, but there's not been a lot of suspense, you know, in terms of PSG just walking the, the league title over the last couple of years. So it was a big surprise. Um, and the fact that Media Pro yeah, came in, not even a French company, and, and, and have put this money in. There, there, there was surprise. There were also reports about how Media Pro had been talking to Syria and that Syria had done their due diligence and decided that they didn't want to go with Media Pro because they, they weren't convinced about the financial guarantee. So there was concern in France, particularly because Media Pro have taken quite a lot of time. They've been leaving it quite late to sort of set up their channel. So people have still been thinking, well, hang on, are they, you know, they're not going to sort of walk out on us at the last minute, are they? But they are finally sort of getting things set up now. Sort of the timing is quite bad for a number of elements. Um, is it a good time to bring a book out? Obviously, it was taking a long time to write and to you know go through the various drafts and so on, and then this happens. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. Is 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 the answer? I would, you know, the fact that bookstores are, are closed at the moment, as far as I'm as far as I'm aware, in the UK, I, I don't know if that's the case in Ireland, um, would suggest it's not a great time to to bring a book book out. The book industry has obviously taken a a big hit. I think it is slowly starting to sort of to wake up a bit again. You know, the flip side is that people, certainly during the lockdown, have a lot of time on their hands and probably are keen to read about things other than COVID. And also newspapers, podcasts and radio stations are keen for other things to talk about. So, you know, I'm I'm hopefully getting a, a bit of publicity for it. The reason that 
we brought it out and I sort of busted a gut over Christmas to try and finish this book was to try and bring it out before the Euros. So when the Euros were, were postponed, yeah, I, I, I was certainly thinking, do we put this back? Um, there may be an updated version to come out before the, before the Euros actually do take place, if they take place next year. But um, look, I don't know. Yeah, ask me that question again in a few months. <laughs> okay, we'll bring you on in a few months. But the process of putting it together, you've done a, a bewildering amount of interviews, a lot of legwork, and the angle that you're taking going into this about, you know, the rise, the fall, the rise again. Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I moved to France in 2002 um, at a time when the national team was having its first sort of implosion since you know, winning the World Cup in 98 and then the Euros in, in, in 2000. And it's just been a, a roller coaster. It's a bit of a cliche, but the, the French have either been brilliant winning World Cups or getting to the final in 2006, or they've just been utterly utterly dreadful, not only in their performances, but also in, in, in their behaviour and... And it's just it's just quite interesting, really, the the relationship the French have with uh, with football. Um, obviously, in '98, the Black Blanc Bird team was um, thought to have this massive sort of unifying social impact. You know, it was fantastic when it happened, and I was at, at the World Cup in '98. It's when I first maybe fell in love with France and, and French football. But it was only momentary, and there have been a lot of a, a lot of race related problems social problems in france uh, in the last 20 years uh, unrest in in the french suburbs and the link between football and society in france is a very strong one partly because a lot of the football players are from immigrant backgrounds and just like when they won the world cup in 98 everybody was saying you know how fantastic it is to have people from all these different countries all these different cultures coming together to win a world cup when things started going wrong when the team went on strike and when there were all sorts of uh, scandals and, and problems off the pitch, politicians and certain people in the media were very quick to say, you know, this is a reflection of, of our society and the problems that we witness in French suburbs, the suburbs of Paris in particular, where there, where there has been a lot of unrest, there has been a lot of violence. And um, I thought in 2018, it was absolutely, you know, incredible again. Because you think the second time, you know, the first time you win a World Cup, obviously the country goes absolutely crazy. And that's when football really took off in France. But 2018 was amazing as well. And it just has this sort of beautiful, unbe- unbelievable, yeah, feel-good effect on, on, a, on a whole country. And Kylian Mbappe, the fact that he comes from Bondi, which is one of the worst or one of the most affected um, suburbs in terms of unemployment. When there were the riots for three weeks in 2005, Bondi was one of the most sort of um, violent and most badly affected areas. And, you know, Mbappe's kind of grown up through all this and he's come through it (laughs) unscathed, as it were. But he's now like a wonderful role model. And I see it firsthand with with my children who took an instant shine to him and his goal celebrations. And I see what it's like on the the playgrounds in France. And um, yeah, he's very much the central figure of my book. But the book, does tell the the story of all those ups and downs over the last 20 years. But the fact is as well, his generation, people about his age, don't remember the first World Cup success, even though it is reasonably recent being 22 years ago. Yeah, and that probably helps, to be honest. For, For quite a long time, I think French football has suffered from the comparison with their their predecessors, because after 98... Like Jacquet's team kind of became the blueprint for French football. They wanted to develop more Desailles and Vieiras and, of course, Zidane's as well, if, 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 if possible. But the French have been very guilty. The media have been very guilty of saying, here we are, you know, we've had about a dozen new Zidane's and some of those guys, you know, disappeared without trace. Kamel Meriam and uh, Murad Megni who were really talented young kids. Others have got closer, Samir Nasri, Johan Gorkuf, but none of them have been able to sort of live up to that billing. And uh, there have been many new Vieiras and new Desailles as well. And I think it's probably a help that Mbappe and Pogba don't really remember those players and they can make a team in their own image and be their own, their own people, their own players. And in terms of Paris Saint-Germain being so dominant for so long over the past decade or so, how, how's that viewed within France? Is that seen as a, as a bad thing for the quality overall? Or is it just, you know, they're the best and deservedly so, and, you know, they're our team for the Champions League, and if anybody's going to have success in Europe, it's them? 
Um, I, I was always very positive. I think in the first sort of four or five years, the French very much welcomed, you know, the arrival of big names, Ibrahimovic and Thiago Silva, etc. And having this, having this great team and, you know, in 2016, 17, Monaco managed to rival them and managed to win the league title. And the problem in France has been that the other big teams, Marseille, Lyon, to an extent, Monaco, to an extent, I don't know, you could include Bordeaux, but I mean, you know, they just haven't been able to build and get anywhere near um, Paris Saint-Germain. So while, it, while I thought for a while it was good and it looked like PSG, you know, they, were, they had this five-year plan to win the Champions League and they started knocking Chelsea out and they were getting to the quarterfinals and you thought, here we go, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kick on, but actually it's gone the other way and they've started bottling it and they've started going out in the, in the last 16 and walking the domestic title and that that I would say has definitely had a more kind of negative impact in the country. So it was fun for a while, but now, you know, the gap is uh, so big and no one can quite see where the next challenger is coming from. And yet they're still not doing any better in the champions league. So I would say, yeah, it's having more of a, more of a negative effect. But again, I don't want to put the blame on PSG. They can take some of the blame for some of their champions league cockups, but the blame for me has to come more from the Leons and the Marseilles who've just been unable to, to put together a strong enough team. You know, I'm not saying they should be winning the league, but they shouldn't be 30 points behind PSG. Yeah, I, I think you know, that's a good point, Will. I mean, uh, we, we talked about it last week, uh, Matt. Uh, it was one of the observations we, we made. Um, I think, you know, you, you're right on that, on that, on that point that uh, basically uh, Lyon, Marseille, Monaco, those clubs, you know, they have a large budget. They should be able to attract, you know, a, uh, players and try to compete with PSG and and the problem is you know it's not PSG it's uh, like those guys they, what, what do they need you know to uh, to compete with PSG and not you know falling behind 15 points and uh, I think it's down to the model of those clubs you know Monaco like even Bordeaux or Lille or more or less you know trading clubs what they want is just to get players and sell them there's not ambition and they're not ambitious enough uh, try to catch a PSG it's more trading players, making money to the clubs and the shareholders to a certain extent. I know Lyon, they have a large budget. We're talking about 300 million around that. And, uh, and they're miles, miles away where they should be. And uh, that's, you know, that's an issue in terms of, well, from the coaching staff, from the scouting as well, department. They have to look at it, you know, the players are bringing the club. But uh, surely that's an issue is to be addressed, you know, with those clubs. Yeah, I've always... I've always been a fan and an advocate of Jean-Michel Aulas just because I think, you know, he's done such an incredible job with Leon, the president, since 1987. And at the start of this season, the first two games, they beat Monaco 3-0, then they beat Angers 6-0. And I was thinking, here we go, we're going to have a proper title race. And I just thought they had the quality. You know, Dembele and, and Depay were scoring goals. Awa was looking good in midfield. And, and it just went completely off the rails. And uh, you, you look at the appointments he made, Janino coming back as a sporting director. Again, that excited me because such a wonderful footballer, such a great guy, but how qualified is he as a sporting director? And it doesn't look like Olas has given him really the power that maybe a sporting director should have. And the appointment of Silvino obviously backfired and he was sacked after, after three months. And uh, I was, yeah, really surprised. And I, I honestly thought Leon were going to compete with PSG this season, but I was completely, completely wrong. Just going back to the book, Matt, um, I think I first met you actually very briefly at a France Switzerland World Cup qualifier back in 2005. I was on exchange in Paris at the time. It was a nil all draw. David Trezeguet, the man who scored the uh, winning goal in Euro 2000, was being booed uh, by the French supporters at the Stade de France. Can't remember why. I think he was just missing a couple of chances. He was going through a bad time. They were obviously in Ireland's group at the time. And I was just thinking, have you got any answers as to why there's so many peaks and troughs with France because you think back you have that team that was unloved under Dominic and then they persuade Zidane, Makaleli and Thoram to come out of retirement so they reached the World Cup in 2006 you have Thierry Henry's handball in 2009 the training ground boycott disaster um, in South Africa there's so many points even going to the whole Karim Benzema, Mathieu Valbuena thing there's so many points in French football history where they seem to press the self-destruct button and then they have so many good players that when they do get it right, they get it right in spectacular fashion like in 2018. Yeah, yeah. I, funny, I remember 
not sure. I, yeah, no, I do remember meeting you, but I remember that night. <laughs> I remember that night. I think Omri was booed and Trezeguet were booed. And I just remember thinking, my goodness me, like imagine having strikers like that and booing them, like they'd missed a couple of chances. And yeah, that France was struggling under Dominic. They were getting a lot, a lot of nil-nil draws. Um, but yeah, Stefan might be able to tell you more than me, but the, the, um, the French fans, especially in Paris, can be a bit fickle. They, they get the name, the Futix, which, which was the mascot of the 98 World Cup. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of them, I'm not speaking for all of them, there are a lot of proper football fans in Paris as well, but a lot of them were, yeah, like got into football when France were winning and just expected them, them to win. So, you know, not being able to beat Switzerland at home, well, we, bet, we, we better boost some of our players. But I don't think we can blame, blame the fans for, you know, for the, the highs and the lows um, so much. I think probably weak management from from the federation's point of view. I mean, there was absolutely no way Raymond Dominic, you know, should have survived Euro 2008. He was already a dead man walking in Euro 2008. France were absolutely terrible. And when they didn't sack him, because I think the pre- the federation president probably would have had to stand down as well. And there are these guys who pull strings in France. Gerard Houllier is one of them, and Houllier was backing uh, backing Dominic. Anyway, you know it's very political, I think. And and Dominic stayed on, and he had he just lost any lingering respect he had, any authority he had. It, it had disappeared, and that World Cup campaign already, you know, which ended with Omri's handball against against your lot, was pretty shambolic. You know, from a from a collective, from a team point of view, they kind of. They finished second behind Serbia and they, they muscled through getting the odd win against Belarus and, and countries like that because there was some brilliance from Ribéry or Gorkiv. It was nothing to do with the team play. They had no real plan. And uh, Dominic was telling Nikola and Elka to play as the centre forward and Elka was sort of saying, well, actually, I prefer a free roll. I prefer dropping deep. And uh, that's what I do with Chelsea. And Dominic's like, no, 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 that's not what I want. But he just did what, you know, and Elka did what, what he wanted. So I think, I think there's, yeah, there's that, a lack of authority. I think there's probably something in the culture of the, of the French players. And, uh, you know, I don't want to tar all of France's youth with the same sort of brush, but there was definitely a different kind of mentality um, with the players coming through, whether it was a Nasri, Benzema, that whole sort of generation, the, the, the team that was winning youth tournaments, Nasri, Benzema, Ben Arthur and, and, and Menez, who was supposed to have wonderful careers and I think thought, they were superstars before they actually were. And, you know, we all know about the Nasri taking Thierry Henry's seat on the bus. And that was just one little story. But I think there was a lot of little moments like that going on where you had Churam and, and Henri and Vieira thinking, well, who the hell are these guys? And what, what have they done in their careers? And, and it all made for a pretty explosive cocktail. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's hard. You, you know, it's all it's, it's a culmination of a lot of different factors, I think. But they certainly, yeah, they certainly became the new Dutch, didn't they? The, 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 the masters of creating problems when there shouldn't really have been any. And in terms of the people you interviewed then, would they put their finger on why things were so right in 98 and uh, 2018? It was, it, it was it's very difficult to get, first of all, to get anyone who, who, who was there in, in 2010 and then to get them to talk. There seems to be like this unofficial pact that nobody says anything about what actually happened at Neisner when they all decided to, to, to go on strike. But um, probably Lilian Turam, who's a very, very interesting guy and a very intelligent guy. Uh, I'd, I'd say he was probably the most interesting. He retired in 2008. And in his last game, when they went out of Euro 2008, he said, you know, everybody was sort of just getting changed, getting ready to go home, probably like sorting out their holiday plans. And he was overcome by emotion and just started crying. And because he, you know, his 142 cap career was, was coming to an end and it was just a very sad end. And um, he then, he then gave a speech to everybody and, and said, listen, you know, you guys have got to, you've got to learn that you can't achieve anything on your own. And I think he tried, he tried to give a speech talking about his career saying I've achieved this and it's been incredible, but it's all thanks to my teammate. And this is a team game and we have to, hoping that the message would kind of would kind of go through and um he talked about that he talked about having long conversations with Vieira about the new generation and they were trying to understand why they don't get it and he said he took one youngster to one side and said you're going to be a big player in the coming years you've got to wake up you've got to realize that the way you're behaving the way you're talking to the media the way you're acting with teammates 
it's it's not good enough you know this you know this is not how a leader of the france team and i said to him because i was absolutely certain i said it was sammy natri wasn't it and joram looked at me and said i'm not telling you who it was but <laughs> but um yeah he was he he was really interesting olivier Giroud was quite interesting as well because he's very much in the mold of a you know a team player who didn't have the talent doesn't have the talent of a lot of a lot of the players that that i mentioned and yet he is the guy who has been played who has been picked more than any other player under Didier Deschamps. And he started uh, in 2012 and he was at Euro 2012 as a, as a substitute. He felt already at the time that it was a team of individuals and, you know, he really bought into Deschamps ethos. Deschamps came in after Euro 2012 and said, you know, it, it's all about the team. And Deschamps has often been criticized for picking, say, Musa Sissoko, uh, you know, constantly on the right side of midfield rather than a, Know, one of France's many talented attacking players, but he wanted guys who would just respect exactly, you know, what the guidelines are, and uh, and would put the team ahead of ahead of anything else. And I think Giroud, for all his shortcomings, has always done that in his career. Yeah, that that to me, anyway, is the the biggest, or well, the best thing that Deschamps did was to get rid of those potential bad apples, despite all the pressure, and um, get everyone involved. And, and pulling in the same direction and you know that game that changed everything I guess when you look back was the World Cup playoff in 2014 as far as Deschamps was concerned 2-0 down against Ukraine and then they win 3-0 three, three in the return interesting goal scorers in that game Saka with two and Benzema it's it's funny how that sliding door moment happened and Deschamps went on you know obviously had the success he did yeah, no, it would have been the end, of course. It would have been the end for Deschamps had they failed to qualify for, for that World Cup. And yeah, on paper, it, it looks like a good win, but it doesn't look like anything that unbelievable that France can beat Ukraine 3-0 at home. But it had never happened in a World Cup playoff in Europe that a team had come from two goals down. And France had actually been pretty average under Deschamps. I think his first year in charge was the worst in terms of results of any France manager. He was under significant pressure. And the way they played in Ukraine, it was just so familiar. It, it resembled a lot of the, the car crashes that we'd seen in, in recent years. They just, they just didn't turn up. They didn't look interested. They were jittery at the back. My, my, my friend, as an Arsenal fan, uh, Laurent Koscielny, a complete disaster, gave away a penalty, got sent off at the end. And yeah, I, I actually, I talked to, to Guy Stefan in quite some detail about, Guy Stefan is, is Deschamps' assistant, um, in quite some detail about how they turned it around. And he talked about the three days leading up to that second leg and how Deschamps gave all these incredible team talks and how the two of them were, were having individual chats with, with players and they were getting them like to watch amazing footage of, of, of how good they were. You know, they put these compilation, goes, oh, look, you know, you're an incredible player. They got them to watch this film, which Guy Stefan told me was good, but I've since found out is terrible. I think it's called La Marche, which was, it's about, it was with Jamel Debouze, who um, is an actor that a lot of the players like. He's very popular. And it was about a march um, against discrimination that happened back in the 1980s when a group of people got together and um, they marched from, I think from Marseille to, or they marched from somewhere in the countryside to Paris. And it was just about people from all sorts of cultures and races coming together and, uh, and triumphing in adversity. And that was apparently the, the key to it all. But yeah, he made some interesting decisions, picking, um, picking Benzema, um, who hadn't been scoring, picking Valbuena. He picked Johan Cabay in a, a central holding midfield role. And Kabayek just had an absolute stormer with uh, Matuidi and Pogba either side of him. He dropped Eric Abidal and played Sacco alongside Varane. That was surprising. And it, yeah, it, it all paid off. But also the French public, and I had a bit of a pop about the Paris supporters, but the Stade de France that night was amazing as well. And, you know, everybody had their trickle or, trickle or flags and everybody was so up for it. And you really did feel like something had happened that night. You know, when you look back at the World Cup, we're now in 2018. There's no question the journey started that night in uh, in Saint Denis at that at, at the Stade de France. Where Deschamps was given the bumps, and Giroud led the um, rendition of the Marseillaise. He got the microphone. Benzema also had the tricolor flag over him, which was you know very significant because people have often questioned his patriotism, the fact that he doesn't sing the Marseillaise. So yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely a big, big night. Who knows what would have happened? But, you know, I, I say that was 
kind of the turning point going to the World Cup. There was actually at the World Cup, and at the start of my book talks about this, how they'd been so average in the group stages in, in, the, in Russia. And they'd laboured past Australia, got a 1-0 win against Peru, and then they drew 0-0 with Denmark. It was a second string team. It was one of the worst games ever in World Cup history. And the France fans were all booing them off. And I remember talking to France fans in Kazan, and they were all ready to go home, looking forward to Zidane taking over because he'd just left Real Madrid. And it kind of felt like, yeah, we, the Deschamps thing was, was over, but Didier had other ideas. <laughs> yeah, it's something very interesting about Didier Deschamps and uh, his, his trademark as a leader um, prior to the Ukraine uh, return leg. He was very confident, even after the last 2 nil in Ukraine. In his mind, there's no doubt, you know, France going to qualify. But if you reflect on, you know, Deschamps' career as a player as well, he was very, very confident and uh, always in control. If you remember in 2000 when France played Italy in the final of the uh, Euro, Obviously, France has to equalize, you know, to go to extra times. And uh, the only one who was running to get the ball at the throw was Deschamps. He was one of the rare players on the pitch to believe he was feasible to score that f- goal to, to bring France to the, uh, the extra times. And that's epitomized, you know, Deschamps' leadership and, you know, ability, you know, to believe even in the worst situation, he will be there. And he's really the main driver of the French team for the last few years now. And uh, people dispute, you know, his style, but clearly, like, that game against um, Ukraine, yes, it's a start, you know, for Deschamps' era. But also, you can, you know, we can forget, you know, the uh, Euro final lost in France. It could have, you know, been a disaster for the French team for the World Cup. But he managed to bounce back again. And uh, it's down to his leadership, his ability as well to build a team around him and, uh, and players he can trust. And uh, he's very loyal to the players as well. Like Giro is a perfect example of it. Yeah, but it's interesting what you said about the Euro 2000 final because uh, that's exactly what, what Robert Pires said to me. He said, uh, he said, oh, we had to keep believing. And then he looked at me and said, but nobody believed. You know, nobody believed apart from one person, and that was Deschamps. And he was barking at us, shouting at us, and he had that mentality you know, that suited him so much in Italy as well. And that, that's what the French always say. You know, we did the Italians at their own game, if you like, and you know, they, they nicked that equaliser at the end. And... Uh, but you're right, it seems that Deschamps was the one person, you know, because Italy getting a goal again, against them, it was, it was such a tight contest. But France as well, they had those substitutes. You know, Pires, Pires was one of the substitutes. He came on against Portugal as well. They, they would send on Pires, Wiltord and Trezeguet. And um, that's pretty useful as well to have, sort of going into extra time, isn't it? And have you managed, you know, through your book, have you managed, you know, to talk to some of the coaches or managers at the time? You know, like maybe uh, Raymond Domenech. I know he doesn't give many interviews. But, yeah, you know. I, was, I was a bit disappointed, actually, because Raymond, uh, I was in touch with him and he agreed to do the interview. Um, and then he just sort of kept dodging me and I couldn't, I couldn't get the rendezvous sorted. I could, um, so, yeah, M, 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 M. Jacques, I would have loved to, to have got as well. I didn't manage to. So. Difficult. It's it's yeah. It's mainly players. I tried hard with with Deschamps, of course, and uh, you know ended up with Guy Stefan, which shouldn't be seen as a consolation because he's a very mm. very good guy. Was also the uh, assistant to Roger Lemaire in two thousand, and so he's you know he's been through a lot, and he knows Deschamps perfectly. Worked with him at Marseille as, as well as with France. Um, so in terms of coaches, I mean, I spoke to Gerard Houllier. I spoke to Houllier a lot. I talk a lot about the. Um, the French sort of, uh, the, well, the youth structure and the coaching uh, system and Houllier was very important in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, setting everything up at, at Clairefontaine. So he was very happy to talk to me about um, yeah, how he kind of laid the groundwork for, for France's future success. I'm sure. And, <laughs> and Arsene Wenger as well. As I had a, had, a, had a chat with him and Arsene has written the forward in the book. Chatted to Reynold Denowix, who was a... Uh, um, very highly respected and very intelligent coach who, who did such wonderful work at, at Nantes and knows a lot as well when it comes to, to youth development. So, so hopefully there's quite a, quite a lot of good coaching input in there. But, you know, it's, it's kind of endless as well. Where it's sort of in terms of the people, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to have speak, spoken to 50 more people and maybe you have to keep that for the next book. And, you know, from your book, like, did you see, like, a different style of coaches, you know, a different style of leadership from one coach to the other ones? I mean, when you're, when you're writing the book, obviously, you have to think about, you know, like, let's say, you know, Ouye and, and Deschamps and, and uh, Domenech and Le Maire. And do you see, like, a trend, you know, because we know, like, if, you, if, you're, if you're a foreigner and you catch, you know, the French system, um, the French Federation, 
at some point, you know, after the World Cup, they tried to sell the model of the French, uh, the French, if you want, uh, products and uh, the way we produce the players in France. And uh, yeah. I know Germany was interested. I mean, Spain went to France, Brazil as, as well. And, uh, you know, we tried to explore ideas and the way we produce players. But uh, have you seen, like, uh, anything like that, you know, across the different... Because, for example... Le Maire is from the French Federation, more or less. Dominic, to some extent, they all come through the, uh, the youth and then they get the, the position of the uh, national coach. And, yeah. and Deschamps is the only one that didn't go through, that for, you know, didn't through the, uh, the federal uh, path, if you want, and uh, came from the club. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, obviously, yeah, Dominic's sort of past with the, with the federation, with the under-21s was, was one of the main reasons that that he got the job in, in, in 2004. There is, there is a chapter about French coaching. It's not particularly positive, but you know, more in terms of the, like the recent years and the way that in Ligue 1, they seem to recycle a lot of the same coaches and they seem to be stuck a little bit in, in, in the same mindset. I think the, the coaching philosophy um, in France you know, is defined in, in Clairefontaine. Gerard Houllier was very influential with that in, in, in the 1990s, I think one of the big problems was that they got a bit complacent after winning the World Cup and, and the Euros. M.A. Jacquet, um, the coach in 98, became the technical director. And um, speaking to people who, who worked a lot on the French game back then, they, you know, they say that M.A. Jacquet just was an awful appointment, actually. You know, he's, he's, he's a revered figure in France, but... He didn't have the appetite to, to carry on working at a grassroots level in French football and basically took advantage of France's position in the world game. It didn't do anything. It didn't really take anything forward for the next nine years. And what's interesting, Stefan, is that when, yeah, when Laurent Blanc takes charge in, in 2010 and soon after that, there is the, the quota scandal that, that comes out. Now, there's a lot that can be said about the quota scandal, but one of the, the main issues that they were discussing apart from the one of dual nationality where players, where France are training players who can go on to represent another nation. One of the main problems that Laurent Blanc felt there was that was fr France was developing the same type of player. He felt that sort of, you know, smaller players were getting overlooked at the age of 12 or 13 and that French academies wanted big, strong, physical footballers. And Laurent Blanc made the link between that and there being a lot of black kids being taken in, into the academies. I think, you know, it was also a time when Spain were dominating French football. And there was this famous quote from Laurent Blanc, which sounds absolutely awful when he said, uh, when I go to Spain, um, they say to me here, we don't have any problems because we don't have any blacks. I mean, you know, that sounds dreadful taken in isolation. In the context of the actual meeting, it still sounds quite bad. But Laurent Blanc's point was, and he, and he made this. He said, if we had Xavi in Iniesta in France, if they were kids growing up in France, they probably wouldn't have turned professional because they wouldn't have got into academies. And that in itself is pretty shocking. And France had somebody like Antoine Griezmann who was struggling. And only when he moved to Spain at the age of 15, did he start to flourish. So, you know, while um, it was dealt with in a very sort of clumsy and there were racial or racist undertones to, to what was said, I think there was a need as well for France to change the criteria. And I'm certainly not talking about skin color or, or race or culture, but the, the type of footballers they were recruiting for the academies at, at the age of 12. And I think that started, you know, with the 98 success. You know, 98, there was Zidane, who was absolutely wonderful. And, there, you know, there were a lot of wonderful footballers, but the real strength of that team was that it was so strong, so athletic, so solid. And that kind of provided the bedrock, I think, for, for the French game for several years after that. Did you feel like, uh, again, you know, going back to 98, every, you know, a lot of people is, you know, thinking in France, yeah, or, you know, abroad as well, that, uh, that, that, that was, you know, 98, you know, the, um, the peak of French football in 2000. But in fact, you know, from a, from a French perspective, was, you know, decline. That was, an, you know, announcing the decline of French football because you talk about, you know, the... Uh, Academies and yes, I mean if you look at you know the structure of the French team in 1998, we wanted to replicate the same with let's say in the middle of the park with strong guys, you know physical guys because it was, it was a physical team. There's not a question because Stephen Givard didn't score a single goal in the World Cup. 
but it was based on on, on solid, you know, uh, defensive, you know, uh, how we see um, a mindset and players. If you look at the team, Carambe, Manuel Petit, Deschamps, and so on and so on, and Patrick Vieira, and we tried, you know, to replicate the same type of players. And have you seen that, you know, have you seen the change when you, when you, you know, you wrote the book across, you know, from 98 up to now, that a trend, you know, a change in French football, or do you think it's exactly the same? It's a good question. I still think it's a problem. I don't know if it's exactly the same, um, but I, I, I do think it's still a problem. I think that clubs, academies want to, want to win or are under pressure to win. And, and the, the best way of doing that, you know, is to get 13, 14 year olds who are bigger than the rest and, and stronger than the rest. And uh, that's, you know, not always good for the development of, of the French game. And uh, I was reading an interview with Claude Puel a few, a few weeks ago, and he, he came back from, you know, having worked at Southampton and, and at Leicester. And he said, Ligue 1 hasn't changed. We, we have play, we still have too many players, you know, who penetrate through their physical strength because we are still picking players based on their size. I think it's a deep rooted problem. And the fact that Ligue 1 uh, shows so much um, reticence to, I don't know, does it show so much? I, I think it does. I, I think it shows reticence to, to foreign coaches. The way that Silvino was treated notably by Raymond Dominic, who is the president of the coaches union here in France. And, every, and he's also a Lyon legend. Every time Lyon lost under Silvino, Dominic was on Twitter saying, what a ridiculous appointment. Genesio was doing great and all this. And I do feel like, yeah, French coaches, you know, it's still a closed shop and they still protect each other. But ultimately it, it's at the grassroots level. It's the youth structures that have to change. So um, while... There is a lot more discussion, and I think things have evolved. I still think there is some way to go. And Ligue 1, you know, Ligue 1 still has a problem when it comes to the number of goals scored and, and, and general entertainment. There are too many games that in the first half, nothing happens. And every and the half time, the players say, on est bien en place, like they're happy, you know, we're, we're in position. Um, it's good. Yeah, but nobody's trying to score a goal. Um, and that, yeah, I commentate a lot of games where. <laughs> I think why you know why don't we just start in the second half, guys? Because it's always nil nil at half time. <laughs> I've done a few of those as well. Um, yeah. I haven't lived in in Paris for a few years myself, and seeing that, I guess, decline from the last great side of two thousand and six, I guess, um, with Zidane and Makélélé and Thuram and all those guys. Um, the X factor for me is is and for everyone I guess is Mbappe because he's the difference between France not winning Euro 2016 they couldn't beat a Portugal side without Cristiano who got had Cristiano Ronaldo injured very early lose on home soil against Portugal in the final and then the the big difference is is Mbappe if you think about the the knockout games in uh, World Cup 2018 how much of a of a difference can he make he obviously has made a big difference to French football already but how much more of a difference can he make in the future I think he can go on I think he can go on and help France to win more competitions um he's a guy who you know as far as he's concerned he's only just starting you know and that that's what is incredible I think with with Mbappe as well um you know he didn't even celebrate the World Cup crazily the next the next day when they were going to the Champs-Élysées um he was sitting next to the the French FA president, Noel Legret, and, um, and he apparently, according to Legret, he said to him, do we really have to do this? You know, and he was already sort of thinking about how, how he needs to sort of recover and get ready for the next season. It was the same when he won the league when he was 17 at, at Monaco. Everyone's going crazy and he was just sort of soaking it up, but thinking, well, you know, it, you know it's, it's just the beginning. It's incredible to win the World Cup at 19 and go, yeah, now I want to win more. Um, but that's the case. And um, he is amazing. I think... Maybe you're a bit harsh to say, you know, Euro 2016, they couldn't even beat Portugal. I mean, yeah, it was disappointing not to beat, the fi- not to beat Portugal in the final, but done quite well in that competition and they played very well against Germany. And there was already kind of this feeling that this new generation of Varane, Pogba and Griezmann had, had, something, had something special. And I think the one issue, because we know with France, they're good at finding problems where there aren't any. I think the one issue could be um, that Mbappe's status has got you know, so, so big on a global level that he's actually now bigger than Griezmann, Pogba and others. Um, Griezmann, is, I was talking to Vincent Deluc from, from L'Equipe and he's, he's witnessed a lot of 
implosions with the French national team. And he, he said he thinks it's a genuine concern. He doesn't think Mbappe is... He's not disliked, but he's not kind of part of the boy, one of the boys, you know? It's, it's like, you know, Griezmann and Pogba, it, it was their generation, and now Mbappe's kind of coming in and taking over. And there is potential there for a bit of unrest. But, he, but he's clever enough, Mbappe, I think, not to do anything too too stupid not to rock the boat and he knows that he needs good players around him as well for for France to win but it's going to be interesting to sort of watch that because I think you know De Luc, Vincent De Luc was saying to me he thinks Griezmann is still the biggest star in France maybe Mbappe is close to him now but in the world Mbappe has just gone way ahead of Griezmann and I think you know that's certainly true. Yeah, I guess with Euro 2016 to defend myself um, <laughs> Mbappe is, is the difference in that you know, yeah. I spoke to Antonio Rudiger about um, or after Germany, France, and the UEFA Nations League, and kind of asked him what makes him so special, and he just said, "Like, do you not watch football?" You know, but that's exactly the answer I was looking for. You know, because uh, he, he said, "Like, he's just so quick. He's 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 impossible to mark. You can't mark. You can't. One person can't keep him quiet. You need more than one to take care of him." And I mm. just think he adds so much, and hopefully, will continue developing the way he is. Uh, and I think, you know, looking at um, Mbappé, one of the concerns, like, like Vincent de Luc, it's, uh, it's becoming, you know, a kind of a global brand. And you can, if you look at, you know, what happened last summer, he was uh, promoting uh, a lot, you know, in the, in the States. So he went to different, you know, countries, you know, and uh, he's a very smart guy. But, you know, ultimately, I think he's lucky to have Deschamps around him uh, the, with a French team and to, to make sure he's on the right path because... Yeah, at some point, you know, you have to make a decision, you know, it's going to be football, it's going to be uh, marketing. And apparently, he's well, you know, he's well surrounded and uh, the family is around him and uh, we'll keep an eye tightly on him. But still, like, everything can go very quickly in football. So hopefully, uh, he will stay that way and he can focus on football. But there is that, that side of football and uh, that uh, becoming a global brand like Ronaldo. And But it's about managing both, if you can. And he's such a young guy. He's very mature for his age and people forget about it as well. You know, 15, 20 years ago, I could buy a book by Jonathan Wilson on Eastern European football. Then I could buy Ole Hesse's book on history of German football. There were books by Phil Ball and uh, Jimmy Burns and Spanish football. The only book I had about football in France, it was like Football in France, A Cultural History, published in 2003. And you're talking about a period of 20 years in your book and we already hear how many stories mm. you can unveil just in 20 years. So why do you think there hasn't been the same interest in getting French football stories out for European, first of probably for English readers, but also for all those who can read in English all around Europe? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I'm a little bit bemused by it. People might say, well, we're not interested in the French League. Not many people, certainly, you know, in, in the UK are interested in the French League. But at the same time, the French players and managers have had such a massive influence in the Premier League and in, and, and in football in general. I always assumed, yeah, somebody else would, would write the book. And when they won the World Cup in 2018, I thought, OK, now, you know, I really have to move and write, and write this book because they're the world champions now again. So I don't know. Um, the literary agent I had who was trying to sell the idea to, to publishers had, I wouldn't say she had a lot of knockbacks, but she had a lot of publishers saying French football makes me cold or I don't know, or I just, you know, I mean, I, I can understand that it doesn't inspire the same warmth that maybe Italian football and the culture you know, the Italian football culture, which is, which is incredible. We, we, when you think about guys like Mbappe, you know, we haven't even mentioned Eric Cantona. I mean, I don't talk that much about him in the book because, you know, with the national team, he didn't do that much. But, um, you know, so many incredible football players, so many incredible stories. It's, it's yeah, I've, I've always looked at it as well. I thought, well, hang on, how many books are there on Spanish football, German football, um, Italian football? Okay, even if we say the French League is only the fifth um, in terms of interest, you know, there should be something. There should be something out there. So, um, hopefully, people will be interested. No, because obviously, I'm looking forward to reading it. And uh, people in UK, they have an example of a Cantona changing one club's history. Well, we can say, yeah, Sir Alex Ferguson, he was genius. He he brought him in, but Eric just had to 
pull up and all this stuff. And I, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Manchester United started winning titles and then had David Ginola also playing in England at the same time and being one of the best players in the league. So that was always something that bothered me, honestly. And, yeah. and if you just go back in history and you go to the fantastic team of 58, with Fontaine and Coppa and then Harms playing European Cup finals. And then in the 70s, you had saint Etienne with Platini and also the team mm. that played the European Cup final. And then 82, 84, 86, we, we, we talked about them in different editions of this podcast. There was an absolutely incredible side. And yeah, absolutely. I feel, I feel a bit bad I don't mention the 84 team as uh, much. I obviously do mention them, but um, it was Emmanuel Petit, he said, he said that was an incredible team and he was inspired by, um, by the carré magique of uh, Gires, Fernandez, Tigner and Platini. Um, but he said, unfortunately for them, they, they were born too early or they did it too early because it was in 98 where the world was kind of just ready to embrace football or certainly France was ready to embrace football. And um, yeah, football really sort of became popular for the whole country in, in 98, whereas in 84, it was a big sport, but... I think it was, yeah, it was seen as a lower class sort of sport and it was a little bit like frowned upon by, by the middle and, and upper classes. And then it, it, later it became, it became fashionable. But uh, there are, yeah, there are a lot of stories. No question. Best of luck with the book when it comes out, Matt, and best of luck with the reprint if that happens as well, head of Euro 2021. And um, how are France shaping up for that at the moment, in your opinion? Well, I think it's probably good. I mean, it's not good for anyone. The Euros isn't happening this summer, but France have had, a, you know, the the big players have had a tough season. Uh, a lot of them have been injured. Griezmann's taken a bit of time at Barcelona to show his best form. We know Pogba hasn't played very much. So, you know, a lot of these top top players um, haven't had great preparation for a summer tournament. So, yeah, they'll, they're having a good break now, an enforced break. And uh, hopefully from France's point of view, they'll have a, a proper season behind them. N'Golo Conte, another one who's, you know, had a had, had a difficult season, Rafael Varane. So, yeah, I think France might have struggled to win the Euros this summer, but next summer they'll they'll probably be okay. Thanks, Matt. Hope the book goes well. Thanks a lot. Well, that's it for this week. Back early next week with more. Please remember to rate and subscribe, no matter what your service is. You can leave comments on our Twitter page, Lockdown Football, and shows are now going up on YouTube also. So until next time, from Mark Rodden, Stefan Shawnee, Dimitra Zulai, and me, Will Downing, it's goodbye. <laughs>